Good morning, everyone. Uh, apologies for the delay. We were just dealing with uh, a few technical issues. Um, we will be having attendees on the Zoom platform, so we're just trying to make sure that everyone has access to the fellows meeting. So um, it's around 10 o'clock, if not four past 10 o'clock. So I will hand over to Michael just to um, welcome everyone before we um, dive into the session's agenda. Michael, welcome. Very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Michael Makanga, the Executive Director of the European and Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership. It is such an honor and privilege to see all of you that are joining us this morning and joining us online as we celebrate our 20th anniversary and more important, having the Fellows Day this morning. As you know, when we talk about sustainable transformation, it centers around people. And building capacity in global health has been one of the things that is very close to my heart. And over the last 20 years, we've seen a seven-fold increase in the number of fellows from the first program of EDCTP through the second program of EDCTP. <laughs> and you are the change makers. This has been very clear in the COVID-19 response, that the best response we've seen in countries came from you. When everybody left countries to go back to their home countries, you are the people that stayed in your countries and made it happen. So having this day today, uh, it really, it pleases my heart to see all of you that are joining, to see that we have more than 400 fellows. Here we are talking about research leaders at different levels, uh, of development, starting with um, junior fellows to the most senior fellows that are global leaders in your areas of research. This is what is going to change the world and change the trajectory of research uh, in Africa. So with this, I want really to wish you a very successful day. And without taking much time, I want to give the floor to Michelle Nderu as we see women in science taking the lead. Over to Michelle. Thank you, Michael. Distinguished guests, esteemed fellows, and now virtual participants from across the globe, good morning and welcome to this pivotal gathering where we come together with a shared vision and commitment to advancing global health research in Africa. Today we convene under the theme amplifying the alumni impact beyond two decades, building sustainable scientific leadership and partnerships for global health research in Africa. Our agenda today is filled with a rich array of discussions and insights aimed at achieving specific objectives that form the very heart of the alumni mission. The first mission is networking and collaboration. We've come together to provide an opportunity for esteemed fellows to meet in person, to network, to exchange ideas, and to exploit opportunities that align with the EDSP mission. The power of collaboration cannot be underestimated, and today we open the door to new partnerships and possibilities. Secondly, showcasing achievements. We aim to showcase both amongst ourselves and in front of the broader global health community the immense potential, the journey towards your achievements, and the impact of your research and capacity development work. Third, African excellence. We're here to foster a strong sense of African scientific excellence, leadership, and ownership. And lastly, mentorship and growth. This gathering serves as a collaborative platform to initiate mentorship and inspire personal and professional growth amongst our fellows at various stages of their career trajectories. Our growth doesn't just benefit us as, as individuals, but it has a cascading effect on our shared mission. 
and actually lastly, future collaboration. In the discussions ahead, we hope to ignite conversations about future collaborations. It is through our collaborating efforts that we draw the, pra the practical roadmap for building sustainable partnerships in global health in Africa. Our esteemed partners, presenters today will guide us through a, an enlightening journey. We'll have Dr. Thomas Nirenda, who will share insights on partnering for innovation in global health research in Africa and provide a future outlook. We'll then move on to Dr. Jean Nashega, who is a senior fellow. He'll, he'll provide uh, a, a, his story on how he built sustainable and impactful research partnerships in Africa. We'll then move on to Dr. Dorothy Yebomanu, another senior fellow, who will discuss human capacity development for current and future global health threats. And then we'll get an industry perspective from Juta Reina Drup, and she'll speak on the role of cross-sector collaborations in driving global health research innovation and impact in Africa. After these enlightening presentations, we'll have a question and answer session, which will provide an opportunity for you to engage and seek further insights from our experts. We'll then move on to the second session, which is going to be moderated by Dr. Pauline Beatty. And uh, we'll dive into the digital realm with a focus on online global health tools that will be presented by Mr. Adrian Kruger. We'll then hear about the African Clinical Research Fellows Funders Group, where we'll just go through the objectives and discuss the future outlook of the group. We then have a crucial segment, which will be dedicated to, sh to shaping the African Clinical Research Funders Group agenda where your suggestions, recommendations, and feedback will be invaluable in shaping, again, the agenda and framework of this group. As we conclude our meeting, we'll hear from Dr. Nirenda for his closing remarks. So as we embark on this journey together, I encourage you to engage, collaborate, and make, this, and make the most of this invaluable opportunity. To our virtual attendees, your presence is felt and your contributions are equally valued. Thank you for being here and thank you for your unwavering dedication to our mission. So welcome. But before we get started, a few housekeeping rules. Um, for the virtual attendees, just keep muted um, and post questions in the chat box or raise your hand and someone will unmute you. Um, questions from the first session will be at the end of the four presentations, so I request the presenters to come up to the podium for the question and answer session. Other than that, thank you. So now I'd like to inv invite our first presenter, who is known to many, Dr. Thomas Nirenda, the ADCP Strategic Partnerships and Capacity Development Manager and recently appointed Head of Africa Office. Thank you. Thanks very much, Michelle, for uh, the kind introductions. And uh, welcome to everyone in the room and those online. I am going to talk about partnering for innovation in global health. As Michael said, this should also be a central theme to our capacity development, which includes uh, developing human resources. And my key messages will be around good practices, and being rational in what we do, and being inclusive. Michael mentioned about the lessons we learned from COVID. But for us, working in Africa, the lessons date back more than that. I think Ebola already told us that we need good practices in terms of partnerships that we form, and we need very good rational approaches, and we need to be inclusive. We called for inclusivity. Our voices were not heard, but maybe COVID just stumped uh, on what needs to be done better. So talking about good principles, there are so many out there, but I just wanted to uh, highlight these that have been standing out in my mind since I joined EDCTP, and these are the Swiss Commission for Research Partnerships uh, principles. Good principles that talk to each and every component that should be in what should be a good scientific marriage. So these are issues that you already know, but the question is how we put them into practice, or do we really put them into practice? issues about deciding together, building mutual trust, 
sharing information and developing networks, sharing responsibility, creating transparency, monitoring what we're doing together, disseminating the results, applying the results, and sharing the profits and losses equitably, and increasing the capacity to address the gaps that we find and build on the achievements. These are some of the issues that I think have been resonating, but sometimes I think they slip through in our busy schedules, and so we need to think how we can put them central to our agenda. Be because without a solid base for our partnerships, things will be shaky, and as we go along, priorities will change, and people will be diverted in different directions, and we, 10 years, 20 years from now, we'll wonder where are we and why are we here? And maybe we'll go back to the drawing board and start redesigning things that we could have done better from the beginning. So in terms of rationalizing, I tend to be a little bit uh, controversial and radical about, about things. So I think really a, a continent like Africa should be a focus for learning how partnerships should work. And how rational is this? It says it all, that Africa is the home of 20% of the world population, but has 25% of global disease burden. Yet, very little in terms of research takes place there. For me, this is an area of focus that we should all come and learn from what should be done in such a difficult environment. Because if you build your programs for where there's no problems, applying them into the continent is like putting the cart before the horse. The next point is about the importance of diversity in Africa that is good for science. I always argue that any clinical trial of a disease of global importance should start in Africa because life started in Africa. So if you start a clinical trial in a genetically diluted population in the West and then try to apply those results in Africa, again, you're putting the horse or the cart in front of the horse. And this seems like logical sometimes, but if it makes economic sense, but it doesn't make global health sense, then for us, we should protest against this and say it doesn't really make sense. It may be good economically, but if it ends up killing us all, then it's not uh, something that we should uh, uh, adopt. I al always also point out to people when I, I show them this slide, that if, he, if archeologists, historians, and geneticists agree that life started in Africa, then anything that is going to come and wipe the whole world will also come from Africa. So we need to really pay attention to, to what is going on in Africa. In terms of uh, inclusivity, we are, or we are faced with a lot of challenges. And this is a picture that dates back to 109 years uh, ago and still haunts us. We are all divided according to colonial or language uh, 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 alignments. If you go around Africa, you know, I've got Francophone friends, but you know, when it comes to cultural science, it, it is something that we still struggle to do. We need to find solutions on how we can include everybody. If everybody can speak 10 languages, that would be better, but uh, you know, um, that's not the reality. So what is the solution? And it's up to people like you who can uh, increase uh, inclusivity, uh, removing these artificial barriers. This is a, a picture I always show about uh, uh, the picture 
around the world. So this is from the corruption perception. These are some of the small issues that people use as a rationale to exclude others, and that also goes into science. So this map produced by Transparency International, although it's from 2021, there is an updated one, but it doesn't change very much. The more raids your country is, the more suspicion uh, you have of being a corrupt country. And you can see it's everywhere, from Russia to Africa. And um, so if you're going to use this as a rationale of who to work with and who not to work with, then already you are departing from the scientific uh, relevance of what we should be doing. And the question is, what should we do to bring back uh, science to where it, it deserves to to create a good global health uh, uh, security uh, program. And that works us back into my partnership principles that I put in together. That should be the guiding principle, not what we read in newspapers or what is you know, um, uh, said on BBC, because that will not really protect us against diseases. And. Um, the other issue that we are here for, which is very central, is how we build critical mass to, to include all those areas that are required to be included in research, application of good research results, what we call interventions, et cetera, et cetera. So this is just a picture from WHO, as you can see. Low middle income countries, like where most of our work happen, they have very low numbers of full-time research equivalents per million population. Michael talked about our seven, you know, forward growth, but we need to build on this so that we can move from seven full-time researchers per million population to close to the West, which, who are around 400. And you can imagine this is really a daunting task, but I think we can really uh, do it, looking at what we have achieved so far. So these are some of the programs, for example, that EDCTP has put in place to address some of the issues that I've talked ar ar around um, on. And that's creating deliberately networks that kill competition. Because sometimes competition for just competi competing is a biggest enemy in science. And um, we have programs that build networks around Africa, like this one they call the Regional Networks of Excellence. Again, this is the, to bring it back to my three key messages. This is to address the issue of including everybody and you know, learning from each other, building things together, and doing things according to rationale. Regional eye, looking at things from the regional point of view and expanding them to the continental level. So that's just an example of what has been happening. And the next example, which is in front of us, is, as Michael has said, is the alumni network of EDCTP, which we think is an instrument that we can build on for future research workforce. And I can't emphasize more the importance that uh, it has in the future discussions, like what you're seeing now in front of you. As you know, the World Health Organization in 2022, uh, the World Health Assembly recommended that, you know, to WHO to lead us into what they call uh, strengthening of clinical trial capacity and coordination program under resolution WHO 75.8. And this is a picture that was produced to one of the WHO conferences in Lusaka uh, last month talking about how this African ecosystem can be organized. And you can see the big um, themes there coming out uh, as development of people be 
being one of the key components, and then development of infrastructure being another, and then systems. And for us, you can see that when we talk about development of people, if we can fit into this ecosystem, then we are already talking about a group like of yours, which is the, uh, the, the alumni. Of course, this needs coordination. So in the center of the triangle, there is a coordination mechanism, and that's where our colleagues from WHO Afro, Africa CDC, uh, Uda Nepad, could be encouraged to work together to coordinate us all to make sure that the programs we have built can be multiplied um, uh, tenfold or you know even more. So again, in closing, I would like to really emphasize that in my view, the future of partnerships in global health requires having good practices that we can all follow, and secondly, having good rationality to do science based on facts about how the menace of diseases is really depriving the world economically and also otherwise, and making sure that we do not leave anybody behind. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a very nice discussion as we go along. Thank you, Tom. So we'd move on to the next presentation from Dr. Jean Neshega. Dr. Jean Neshega is a tenured associate professor of epidemiology, infectious diseases, and microbiology at the University of Pittsburgh. He's, uh, in fact, it's Professor Neshega. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> um, he, is, he has more than 25 years of experience in patient care, teaching and designing and implementing HIV, AIDS, and tuberculosis studies, or programs funded by the NIH. PEFA, EDCTP, and the Wellcome Trust. He's authored more than 230 peer-reviewed publications, and he was the recipient of the 2022 International Association of Physicians in AIDS Care Award for Outstanding Contribution to HIV Treatment Adherence Research with evidence of scientific impact as well as mentorship of younger investigators in the US and Africa. In addition, he's an ad hoc expert consultant for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the US CDC, the World Health Organization, as well as a member-elect of the Academy of Sciences of South Africa and the Academy of Sci African Academy of Sciences. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nderu. Uh, it's really a privilege to be here today. and. Uh, uh, to uh, give you uh, a personal journey to um, how I started my research and uh, where we are, uh, where I am today. So uh, looking back, uh, uh, I still feel somewhat emotional, uh, uh, but the journey st started basically, I was uh, born in Democratic Republic of the Congo, but I left Congo when I was a teenager uh, I left for political, uh, my family was persecuted politically, so we moved uh, to Belgium, where I did my medical school and my uh, residency uh, in internal medicine and fellowship in infectious disease. But I was uh, really bored to do clinical medicine. My mission, uh, internal mission was really, I wanted to go back to Africa and to do research. But as you know, we're not equipped to do research as clinician. So you need to learn some more skills. Uh, and those research skills, uh, I got a scholarship uh, to uh, do an MPH, to be able to learn epidemiology, biostatistics, and, and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Nderu asked me to, uh, to, to give a, a little bit uh, of uh, my experience of uh, what was critical. And I think at that stage, I think, what was critical in my path was uh, uh, mentoring. Uh, to have key critical mentoring was a key. After I finished my MPH, I was about to go back to Belgium, 
and to explore opportunity to go back to Africa and save my continent. And then I got a, a call uh, from Professor Chason, Dick Chason at Hopkins saying, Jean, I hope you're still uh, in town uh, because I would like you to join and direct our HIV research program in South Africa. So, uh, and uh, working originally in Soweto <coughs> with Glenda Gray and James Monkey Tyre until I moved uh, to Cape Town uh, to work with Gary Martins as we got a NIH R01 grant, uh, which did also complement my K award uh, that I received for early stage investigator. That was uh, a really a career uh, changing path at that time. And the, the research was to try to investigate. Uh, we were really in excitement of uh, uh, rolling out antiretroviral uh, in South Africa. Western Cape Province was really leading uh, the way. And the idea was how there was skepticism, how African will live uh, without electricity, without a watch, and uh, in poverty can take highly complicated antiretroviral. And that was kind of a, a sentiment which uh, included some racism uh, 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 sentiment. So we were, we tried to evaluate really, say this can be achievable, adherence to antiretroviral can be achievable even in a low resource limited setting. And uh, we evaluate a model of a family member to, to try to uh, take antiretroviral uh, using uh, family supervised treatment. So we shown that uh, it was not the observation that may, did matter. Uh, the viral load did not uh, differ in control in the experimental group, but what did differ, it was the social support that improved survival. And uh, so those were uh, my early results that were published. And uh, uh, after at that time, I had my MPH, but I really did aspire to get a PhD. And again, uh, my mentor, Chason, and uh, in Cape Town, Gary Martins, were really the key uh, to that. And, uh, and I wanted to have a degree from my continent. So UCT, University of Cape Town, was the ideal place to receive that. Uh, so I just did the PhD by publication, just. Uh, uh, capitalizing on my research uh, on antiretroviral adherence. Uh, and again, uh, Michel uh, wanted to emphasize that we emphasize how critical, not only the mentor were, but also to have the critical mentor, but also the, the critical mentees. Uh, and uh, there is many, I have many mentees, but I'll just highlight two here in interest of time. Uh, Ingrid Eshan Wilson and Olalek Utman, as you can see, uh, first author while working with me on key paper in high impact factor. Uh, but also, uh, at that time, I also got opportunity uh, not only to receive an EDCTP senior fellowship uh, to conduct a randomized trial for immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome uh, prevention with uh, meloxicam. We we, were, uh, we experienced a lot of, of regulatory complication to get that uh, study completed, but we were able to provide a key contribution data uh, in Annals of Internal Medicine on uh, uh, risk factor for TB iris, which did help uh, ground monkeys finally to complete uh, uh, that work. At that time also, we realized uh, I was also privileged to get uh, a fellowship at Harvard and uh, to do biostatistics in net research. And one of my key mentors there was Steve Lagakos, who, by the way, passed away. Uh, and uh, uh, this was really also an uh, important uh, point. Just to few highlight uh, some of the award that uh, Michelle mentioned, I'm not going to uh, go there. So. Another point that I think is important in this forum was uh, uh, working in Cape Town, uh, Bongani Mayosi uh, and a few uh, colleagues, uh, we tried to look at uh, what the productivity of uh, 
or young investigator or researcher on the continent. And we realize, uh, uh, and again, working with uh, my mentee, Olaleka Utman, uh, we found that uh, there was really uh, uh, heterogeneity or AIDS research output uh, on the continent uh, from west to central to east Afri Africa. Uh, the key point w was the key message. Uh, there was a steady increase uh, over time, uh, but uh, there was also the percentage of share while it was increasing was still uh, far uh, small to what one would expect. So there was a need to reinforce uh, research culture uh, to try to look at key health priority uh, for national government uh, to strengthen health system and build capacity uh, to uh, implement, promote uh, good uh, uh, practices but also to uh, work on uh, key translation. Build capacity, uh, it's been at my heart and uh, I was also privileged to try to uh, uh, contribute on the continent, uh, working with North and South uh, partnership. One of the major one was with Welcome Trust, as you heard. Uh, I was one of the PI of the SACO, the Southern Africa uh, Research Excellence Consortium. Uh, which uh, it was uh, one of the seven consortia funded by Under Welcome Trust, about a 30 million uh, uh, five-year consortium. Um, and uh, it included institutions from uh, emerging research like uh, University uh, of Malawi, uh, Zambia, Zimbabwe, uh, institutions with established research uh, infrastructure like Stellenbosch and UCT and Botswana, have a partnership, but also uh, institution in the north with uh, highly developed uh, research capacity. That north to south uh, was really uh, game changing uh, in terms of output uh, from just publication to uh, seed grant to a PhD master degree, uh, but also to uh, north south 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 collaboration. I think one of the key challenges was uh, the lack of postdoctoral doctoral structure uh, on the continent was really key, and also paucity of uh, mentor. Another major initiative uh, to build capacity on the continent was the MEPI uh, and Afri Health. This was a 130 million uh, competitively awarded grant by PEPFAR and uh, NIH to 13 medical school. Uh, I was the PI of Stellenbosch. The achievement of uh, MEPI is kind of a, a complemented SACO uh, with some key challenges for MEPI. We realize the really limited outreach to Francophone, Lusophone, which we are now working on, limited local mentor, and limited uh, research and training grant with African as a PI in the leading seat. So uh, my... Uh, let me drive now uh, in the COVID. Uh, I was locked down in Cape Town, and uh, I asked myself how I can make of use my time, and uh, that way we take advantage of the network uh, of Afri Health Network in several continents, and we pull data while there was most so bombarded by data from China, Europe, uh, US uh, on COVID. We were wondering what's going on in Africa. Uh, so pulling data from Ghana, uh, uh, Nigeria, DRC, Uganda, Kenya, and South Africa, we were able to contribute unique data on African continent on some key comorbidity that you don't have in the US or in Europe, like malaria, HIV, TB, what the risk they have uh, for COVID, not only in general population, but also in children and pregnant and uh, the data were published, uh, you can uh, go to look at them. These data were highly publicized, uh, and they serve now in guideline in many uh, uh, countries uh, to support vaccine on the continent, not only in, in general, but also in children and pregnant women. And uh, building on those data, we just submitted a narrow one uh, to evaluate vaccine uptake of COVID, but also other child, childhood uh, preventable diseases 
uh, in pregnant women. During the COVID era, the anti-vax movement had a huge negative impact on uptake on all other COVID, all other vaccine. So this is a work just building up on COVID. And I will try to finish by also uh, showing uh, this program, uh, building on early stage investigator that myself and Professor Sidat at Stellenbosch, we have a diverse group of young talented fellow uh, we are supporting and uh, just to, uh, to build that capacity of a young investigator. And uh, also, uh, as I say, I've been passionate of, of filling the gap in the Francophone uh, corridor in terms of capacity building. As I say, I, I originate from DRC. And so we had with EDCTP and the RF uh, several sessions of building uh, scientific writing and grant writing in Gabon. This was in October 2019 with uh, Anna Lucia Wember, you can see there and uh, also in DRC uh, with some fund for Afri Health NIH uh, at INRB with Professor Jean-Jacques Mouyembe. Jean-Jacques Mouyembe, that uh, some of you uh, uh, know, they co-discovered Fibola. Uh, on that uh, uh, session, we did uh, provide uh, really uh, the ground for a D43, which we submitted also in August on uh, building capacity for Ebola, monkeypox, and uh, uh, MDR-TB. So I will finish here. I just acknowledge my collaborator in South Africa. Um, I'm not going to cite them all in the University of Pittsburgh at Hopkins. Uh, my founder, uh, currently mostly NIH, uh, and um, just also to uh, really celebrate again, uh, thank you to the Springboks who, uh, as again, uh, bringing us together, uh, we are stronger uh, than ever. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prof. So we'll move on to the next presenter, Professor Dorothy Yebomanu. Uh, Professor Manu is the first female director of the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research, University of Ghana and she's a professor of medical microbiology. She had her tertiary education at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology and finished with first class and a BSc honors in biochemistry. While working as a research assistant at NMIMR, she studied at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine for her masters and at the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute, University of Basel, obtaining her PhD in microbiology in 2006. She's a senior fellow of the European and Developing Clinical De developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership, and also a board member for African Research Academies for Women, Ghana, and a fellow of the Wellcome Trust. Welcome. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you also for inviting me to speak on a very important topic that I'm very passionate about, that is building human capacity for current and future global health grants, and good morning to you all. I would like to lay the background and the importance of this topic, looking at our world currently. Uh, we have been plagued with several health threats, and most of these have occurred in Africa and other low and middle income countries. Whilst dealing with these health threats, our world has also, within the Africa, there are several endemic diseases like malaria, tuberculosis, and thereof. Uh, the presentation by Tom indicated the population within Africa, and in terms of global health issues, about 25% of the problems occur within our continent. In addition, there are other silent pandemics that no one speaks about, 
key of them is antimicrobial resistance. Whilst we are dealing with this, and previously we thought that Africa, our key issue is uh, communicable diseases. Now there are a lot of uh, non-communicable diseases that are plaguing our continent, and some of these non-communicable diseases are also changing the epidemiology of endemic communicable diseases. Example we have is tuberculosis and diabetes. Of course, air pollution is coming, and climate change is also changing some of the diseases epidemiology. In spite of this, we've also not been able to engage our community appropriately. And we saw this within the recent uh, COVID-19 pandemic when vaccines were available, but they were all theories. And so our communities were not prepared. In fact, during the West Africa Ebola pandemic, one of the clinical trials was supposed to be to happen in Ghana, but there was so much community perception that if at the end of the day, we have to abrogate the clinical trial because the community were not uh, willing um, to be part of it. And because of all these, um, conceptions within our community, some of the diseases, there is late uh, case uh, uh, detection because they've not um, believed within our former health sector and they rather will go to other uh, sectors for health seeking. And that means that we need to build the capacity of humans to address some of the global health challenges that are plaguing our continent and our other low and middle income countries. Nevertheless, um, there are a few challenges that we need to deal with. And one of them is training. I remember most of us, they needed training and sometimes not only the health interventions, but even the training occurs outside our continent. You go and you are training in one environment and you are supposed to apply it to another environment. And sometimes you get a culture shock because uh, very basic things that you need to work with are not there. Also our medical schools, my country not exception, very much included. We are trained just to render a service but not to interrogate the service. So research um, is not part of the medical training that we receive in our countries. Then mentorship, I'm happy my brother spoke about mentorship. Uh, mentorship is a key problem. When you come back, the very people who are supposed to mentor you become your competitor. Instead of mentoring, you become like a, a competition. And so that does not also encourage and build the needed capacity. And that leads to less um, limits, continuous professional development and collaborations have not been well understood. If you come to Ghana within the informal cocoa sector, the farmers believe in collaboration. They don't work in silos. They pull human uh, um, capacity together to address various stages in terms of cocoa farming and harvest. But the way our former education is rendered, collaboration sometimes are not encouraged. And therefore, in country collaboration, uh, cross border co collaborations, are very limited, and that also leading to reduce uh, research capacity. Of course, grants, we are in Africa, we are supposed to compete with other countries for funding, and in-country uh, funding is very limited. There is also challenges in terms of bridging research and policy divide, and so within the very politicians that we are working with, we've not been able to engage policy makers adequately. And some of them think that research is for the ivory tower in our university campuses, and therefore they don't even see the need and don't put it as part of our their um, budgeting. And because of that, we have reduced our capacity in terms of preparedness to health threats. Uh, I was in a WHO meeting recently, and I was surprised to see that, in fact, all the indicators for preparedness, the WHO Afro region, uh, we are not meeting the level four that is required. And so most of the time, we are limited. And um, Tom indicated about how, because we are limited, a lot of the uh, health policies or interventions are tried outside and they are brought and sometimes it doesn't fit our continent. 
And therefore, there is a very uh, serious need to improve human capacity building to tackle uh, global health threats. I must emphasize that a lot has been done in the past years. There have been several uh, programs to mitigate uh, against this, but still more needs to be done in terms of enhancing research capacity, in terms of equipping our health uh, workers to interrogate the system, but not just render service to see how continuously they can improve our health sector. Of course, how do we make our system so active and resilient to also respond to um, health threats? This needs to be tackled as well. And of course, we need to research how that whatever interventions that we put in place will be based on informed knowledge not because we have been told. Most of our system, WHO says, but what does our health system says? And that is something that is very limited and lacking within our health system. And so uh, one of the key areas that we need to do is to build interdisciplinary capacity within our system, both for research, both for service rendering. In the way such that, um, our human capacity are resilient, they are able to respond to new innovations, become useful to the very industry, and be able to engage the community where we work with. And so there are different uh, ways to go about it. And one of the key areas that for every interdisciplinary capacity building is to have a clear objective. What do we want to achieve and how do we go about it? We need to improve our cross-training, in making sure that our, we have interprofessional education, not to, we are scientists and that is all. We don't um, look at other emerging, emerging uh, solutions. We don't look at other in ways of engaging the community and therefore how social and anthropology is very crucial even for basic science training. Leadership and collaborative research, this has been emphasized by the uh, early, earlier two presenters. We need to look at how do we collaborate, how do we position ourselves to make the most use of collaborations available? How do we make sure within our collaborative efforts, we try to bring individuals from lower resource our institutions to bring their capacities to where we are and of course, providing resources for long term. If we do this, we will then be learning from each other because one expertise is not enough to solve all the global health challenges that we have. Not doctors, not nurses, not the laboratory scientists, neither the anthropologists. But if we work together, we'll be able to create synergy. This will lead to solving the global health challenges that we have and in all this, as this morning has been emphasized, collaboration is very important. I'd like to go on to give you a typical example of one such interdisciplinary training and through collaboration that I was very, I led in Ghana. And that is, um, sorry for the picture that I'll show you the Borreliosa. In fact, this is one of the smallest uh, wounds that we have. At the early, um, Epidemics of Borreliosis, I'll call it epidemic because we didn't know much about it. And within the late 90s, to early 2000s, there were so many cases of Borreliosis in West Africa. And at that time, there was no med antibiotic medication. And the community were not happy to come to hospital because they said that when you come with a small wound, you end up with bigger wounds because the only way of curing was by um, excision. We did a clinical trial in Ghana that led to the regimen using antibiotics. And when that was done, we thought that, oh, we've gotten all the needed solution. But there were so many things that we didn't understand. And still the patients were not coming. And so we had funding for UBS Opt Optimus Foundation with Ghana, Cameroon, and Benin. To, with other northern partners to look at the case of Borreliosa. And I was leading the Ghana one. And within the Ghana one, we had about six PhD students. We have a Kwabna and Sanusa 
the epidemiologist, we have uh, Eric, who's a social scientist, we have uh, Dr. I Tufo, who's a clinician, we have a nurse on the team, we have a microbiologist on the team, and we have environmental scientists also on the team. And we brought senior professionals within different disciplines. We put all these students together, presenting, cross-cutting uh, presentation um, from microbiology, basic um, biology of the diseases, looking at anthropology, and even basic statistics, how they will analyze the data. And I must say, the students learn from each other, and we learn to understand the community perception why are they not coming to the hospital? Why is that even those who come to the hospital, they won't go secondary infection? We are amazed the revelations from the microbiologists working with the um, social scientists, some of the things that we got to understand from the community perception. How do we position ourselves to get the community to buy in? We did a co-creation exercise with the community. We developed manuals for the nurses and the doctors on how to care wound and the results was amazing. And that is what we need to, uh, in terms of designing capacity within our limited resources to get different disciplines to tackle diseases. There are also other things that we can do, and that is within our individual training, experiential learning is very, very crucial. We also need to encourage within the scientific leadership training uh, collaboration, mentorship, as we are doing now, international meeting to foster collaboration, and of course, skill training and institutional capacity building, as we did once within building capacity for our um, national TB control program, where we did situational analysis, we did stakeholders engagement within all the different levels within the national TB control program that led us to development of manuals to tackle that. Of course, um, the importance of global partnership have been overemphasized, and I don't want to read because so many has been done, said in terms of pooling resources, sharing knowledge, and building on individual strength to achieve a goal. So I don't want to emphasize that. But in all this, we need to find means of sustaining the capacity that we build. And one of them is, I uh, would like to emphasize is to look at inclusivity and diversity. And I was happy with the points that Tom raised in terms of respecting each other, making sure things are done equitable and resources are also shared equitably. And as a woman also, we need to think about gender equity because the way we see things are different. And when we bring the various gender together, we can sustain all the capacity that we are building. And to leave uh, my final message, especially for us um, fellows, is that we need to adapt to the evolving research needs of the world. And we cannot do this only within the classroom, but even personal education. And some of the personal education, being aware of the changing needs, we can find it in uh, scientific journals, but now also there are more than just the scientific journals, even podcasts reading newspaper and listen to news is key to educate ourselves. We need to set goals within the changing uh, world. We need to educate ourselves to develop new skills. And we need to, the today we've talked about collaboration, teamwork, and we need to evaluate, continuous evaluating our performance, ourselves as we journey within this uh, research industry. On that note, I want to thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yebo Manu. So we are running behind, and um, I'll quickly request uh, Dr. Yuta Reina Drup um, to come up to the podium. Um, Dr. Reina Drup is the head of Global Health Institute at Merck, based in Switzerland. Her focus is the discovery and development of innovative health solutions for most vulnerable populations, such as children and their mothers in developing countries, to strengthen local capacity and to foster human progress. Since 2017, she's the head of the Merck Global Health Institute, steering a comprehensive portfolio of products to control and eliminate schistomiasis and malaria. Pan-African Partnership Networks, 
and fundraising are key contributors to the Institute's success. Juta also serves as a scientific advisor at advi various boards, including the DSI, DZIF, Scientific Advisory Board in Germany. Welcome. Yes, uh, good morning, and I know we are running late. Um, I think we all received an email from Michelle uh, with a long list of what we could address. It gave me a headache how I should explain all this in 10 minutes, so it is, this is definitely not possible. What I will do, um, I will uh, come to my key message quite quickly. I'm from a um, pharmaceutical company, Merck, um, so I'm representing the private sector and what I can complement to what you have already heard from the three speakers is uh, the view of the private sector in this context of global health. Um, I don't need to explain to you what one of the threats that uh, uh, one speaker already presented, climate change, um, is, uh, th what does it mean for, for global health? So, um, of course, we have many, many challenges and we have complex challenges. Um, I was thinking, who, who are the contributors, the main contributors to uh, find solutions? Of course, UN-based organizations, you know what, uh, of whom I'm talking. The countries play a role, Acad academia, non-governmental organizations, and the private sector. Um, I'm focusing um, on the research landscape, uh, but there was this great presentation by Tom who gave really this overview what is already existing, the uh, landscape in Africa. Um, there is a lot of, I would say, from the past, what I would call north-south collaborations, and we, we see uh, what, what the benefit is of this. What I would like to, to encourage is also more south-south uh, collaborations. Um, the great um, example of more of these networks is, of course, with uh, EDCTP. You have seen um, the, the four clinical research uh, networks across the continent. I think um, these are great examples of capacity building and also delivering um, on, on um, new interventions. Um, still, and I'm repeating here a message, but I think it's really important, uh, there is a gap. Um, there is the, um, the population, there is the disease burden, but if we look at clinical trials, only 2.5% uh, take place in Africa, and if we would go more granular, you would also see that this is concentrated on a very few countries, so it's not really across the, the continent. So, what to do about it? I come to the example of, of my company very briefly. This is Merck, uh, based in, in Germany. Um, it's actually uh, the oldest pharmaceutical company. Uh, it's more than 350 years old. Um, it's still in the hands of a family. Um, it's now the 14th generation. But it's a global company, um, so we are more than 60,000 employees in more than 66 countries. Um, and of course, as a, as a sector, as a pharmaceutical sector, uh, we have to do with health. We want to improve lives um, in a sustainable way. Um, now, what am I doing within Merck? I'm leading the Global Health Institute. And uh, what, what we are interested in is to use our science and technology know-how for innovations, but for innovations that are important for most vulnerable populations. So we concentrate on children, on young children and women in developing countries. We focus currently on two diseases, schistosomiasis and malaria. We use the company know-how in, in many uh, respects uh, to come up with innovations. Um, we, ha we focus really on R&D, uh, but then with R&D, hopefully, hopefully one day you have a product and then you need to provide access and to implement it. Um, and most importantly, and I think that's the point for today is, um, 
we cannot do this alone. We, we are a small group. Everything we do is done in partnerships um, with, many, with many partners. And we have a focus based on the diseases we are in. Schistosomiasis is mainly uh, a disease in Africa. Um, so you see a bit our network. Uh, these are academic centers. Um, these are funders. These are organizations like EDCTP, Wellcome Trust, and GHIT in, in Japan supporting our partnerships. And when I say partnerships, these are mainly what we call uh, public-private partnerships. Um, and you see here, uh, when, when we talk about capacity uh, building from, from our point of view, this is within each project we build infrastructures, we conduct clinical trials together, uh, and we invest in, in education programs. So uh, you see here EDCTP fellowships where we participated in each project. We have students, we have PhD students, we have postdocs um, that are part of it. So that's a bit the overview of the Institute. I give you one example of what it means, a public-private partnership. It's, it's a very prominent example because um, we worked on it for 10 years now. Uh, it's a pediatric, a child-friendly formulation of an existing product called Praziquantel. Praziquantel is a, is a treatment for schistosomiasis. You cannot treat the very young children, so you need a new formulation. We have, work, we have worked on this for, as I said, 10 years with many partners. I show you the, the, the list of partners. We started small with uh, four partners, and during our journey from preclinical into clinical development, we had more and more partners joining. Um, today we have three countries, Kenya, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, and uh, Uganda, uh, joining us as, as uh, um, ministries of health um, in this consortium um, and we are really close to get this product uh, into, uh, into a scientific opinion which is by the European Medicine Agency uh, that we are expecting uh, by the end of, of this year, so very, very soon. Then we have a product and the journey is not done. Uh, we developed it over a decade, but then the question is, how do we reach um, the, the children? We, have, we continue within this consortium um, to, to uh, invest into implementation research to understand how we provide access to this new product. It is one example. We need many more of these examples. Um, and I come already to my conclusion. What, uh, what do we need? We need scientific leadership, and we had a great example this morning. Um, the mentoring aspect is so important. Um, so it's, it should not be competition. I have to say I was a bit shocked when I heard this. Um, we have mentoring programs in the company. This is not a competition. It has to be a senior person that has nothing to do with your job uh, that helps you um, to, to advise on, on career, on work-life balance. There are many questions. I'm myself, I'm a mentor in, in many other programs. Um, you should never think about <laughs> that you are in competition with your, with your mentee. Uh, there is a lot of learning from these international networks. So um, it, it's really, these are opportunities to grow. Um, the sustainability for me is really the aspect we need more South-South networks because what happens uh, uh, often, what I see is you do a clinical study, you build capacity, but the study comes to an end. And then what, how do you sustain uh, this, this infrastructure? So you need a continuous project flow. Um, I thought about involving also private sector locally. Uh, there is more and more um, a private sector uh, on the continent. We talk a lot about local manufacturing. There's, um, there's a lot happening at, at the moment. And when it comes to impact, um, I, I have to say, I, uh, I always come across through this, what gets measured gets done. 
it's, it sounds a bit simple, but it's true. If you have measures in place and you ha have to report, it keeps you on, you know, what you committed to. And then you take this information for decision making, you, you can improve. And um, for all these measurements, you need indicators. And when you go into reports, to EDCDP, to any other organization, you will see it's exactly about this. What, at the end of the day, uh, what is your impact? And um, I hope that this gives you a bit an idea um, that, what, that the uh, private sector plays a role, that these cross-sectoral approaches are really needed. Uh, when I go back to the beginning, uh, climate change um, has a lot of um, challenges now, and the um, infectious diseases um, are, not, are not yet done. Um, um, and it requires really a very much um, collaborative, uh, public-private um, approach to all this. And with uh, this, I, I thank you very much for your attention. but I'm not the only one to yes, take questions. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Dr. Juta. So can I request the speakers uh, to, to just uh, take the podium so that we can um, take questions? So are there any questions that you'd like to pose to the presenters? Does silence mean that the presentation, great. <laughs> Please go to the microphone, it's at the back, thanks. Uh, good morning, uh, my name is Raji Tajuddin Mohammed. I work for the Africa Centers for Disease Control and uh, Prevention. I think for me it's more of a comment rather than a question. And uh, I think, um, I was blown away by the presentation from, uh, from everybody, but much more importantly from Jean, you know, really emphasizing the importance of uh, mentorship, and uh, I think the other speakers also um, alluded to that. And uh, when I was sitting down, I was uh, talking to my colleague that um, as a pediatric resident doctor in northern Nigeria, uh, those days uh, when you talk of uh, mentorship, we used to like joke among ourselves as resident doctors that uh, rather than the professors mentoring you, they are monitoring you, you know? So I think um, really it's high time we begin to pay attention to that space. And uh, as part of what I do at the Africa CDC, I oversee health workforce development, you know? And uh, for me, I think going from here, one of the key agenda for me in 2024 is to really see how do we move this agenda of mentorship forward. You know, I think it's really become something um, very um, critical, very important. Today, you see a lot of our young upcoming leaders, you know, finding themselves in that global health ecosystem, but trying to figure out how to really navigate that difficult um, terrain. And I believe that if you have in place a very structured mentorship program in place, I think it will go a long way really to, I mean, to help. Number two, partnership. I think for me, it's also one thing I'm seeing coming out of this uh, presentation. Today, when you look at the research landscape on the continent, again from the last speaker, you see so many, you know, little, I mean, researches are and there. But what is lacking is not knowing who is doing what where, you know? Again, that lack of coordination, collaboration, communication, and cooperation, you know, I think is not doing us any good on the continent. So I think going forward as Africa CDC, as WHO, um, Afro, we need to do more in that space, you know, to really find a way to map all the partners doing one thing or the other, the donors, the funders, you know, so that at the end of the day, we're able to ensure that the continental priority become what drive the research agenda on the continent of Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll take one last question. Um, and because of uh, time constraints, um, you can have a chat with our speakers um, 
you know, during the forum. Um, any reactions to the comments? Just quickly. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think that's, uh, from my side, is really an important point. And from uh, the funding agency point of view, I would say this is something that we always struggle with because we always give funding for capacity building programs. But the question of the quality of the, uh, of the training or capacity at building, or in your case, mentorship, is always a question. And if there can be a way of ensuring that quality with measurable indicators, I think that would be really very helpful. So we can't say we have a, a continental standard. Um, and uh, if you look at the figures that I presented, if you have very few researchers overseeing hundreds and hundreds of PhDs, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, the professors here will, will have to comment on that, but the, the quality starts to be questionable. And I think your point is very, very important. And coming back to partnerships, we need to have different forms of partnerships and make sure that these partnerships really work. And I think the weakness of partnerships is the lack of their coordination mechanism. So what we call networks that are born and they die before the diseases are really defeated, um, are, are a, a victim of that. Can the regional economic community, like the Africa CDC, be a mechanism where such you know, um, programs are coordinated? You have already talked about what you be coordinating in terms of uh, workforce development. That's really a very good development in my view. And I think that needs to be expanded to other programs so that we see that on the continent uh, we have a uniform approach. As Dorothy said, the training is neither here nor there. I, I, I think most of us landed in the research area, if I m may put my head on the block there, by chance. Because every time I ask in an audience like this, who, after they did their PhD, planned that they will be here today and giving a keynote address in a conference like this, nobody says, I did, I planned that. So it's, it's, a, it's uncharted territory. And the question is, should we really leave it like that? How do you turn doctors into researchers early enough in their training? Nurses, they say, and clinical assistants, medical assistants, we have different cadres in Africa that don't exist in Europe. But when researchers come, they want to put them on a GCP training. I mean, a guy, a watchman, who never thought he'd be in a, a research team gets GCP training. But so what is the, really the logical approach to that we can take as a program? Yeah, I think from an Africa CDC, you are, you, if I may turn around, what you want to say is to how can we have programs in, in Africa that are relevant to Africa? So that would be my comment. Thanks. Can I request that um, if there are any reactions to keep them short or no more reactions? Okay. Last question, keep it brief, please. Good morning and thank you very much for the very excellent presentations. My name is Essen, I am Nigerian but I'm based in the Gambia where I work with the MRC unit. So my first um, question would be very brief. I'm seeing a trend where there is some building of capacity up to the doctoral level, and at the postdoctoral level, many of these African researchers are leaving. So it's sort of the kind of thing happening in my country where we are having clinicians trained and up to specialist level and leaving. So there's also that pseudo brain drain in the research arena. Are there some things we could do to address this situation? And the second question is around funding for African researchers from Africa. Um, like um, Jean um, mentioned in his presentation, most of your fundings are from the NIH. And the truth is that this, the source of the funding would always drive the agenda of the research. Um, the gentleman who just spoke is from the Africa CDC. Are, are, are there ways we can harness more funding 
for research from Africa, whether it be from government or from individuals, so that we would be driving the research agenda and we would be doing the research that we really want to do and not just what the funder from outside the continent desires. Thank you. Yeah, uh, just quick, uh, quick uh, answer. Uh, uh, while most of my funding is from my NIH, uh, those are uh, investigator initiated grants, so you decide what you want to, uh, to study, and most of them are priority on uh, African matters. So in terms of uh, uh, funding opportunity for African, uh, from Africa, so those, they are there, they are not so many, but they are there, especially uh, you can go to MRC in several countries, South Africa, Tanzania, uh, Uganda, so there is some uh, opportunity to compete for uh, uh, in local country uh, funding opportunity, and Africa CDC, obviously, I'm sure they, they are working on that also uh, to give those opportunities, so they are growing, uh, and uh, I will encourage you, uh, we, we can talk, uh, uh, later on during this conference uh, to, to, to give more information. And I'm sure ADCTP also have. Uh. Prof, did you have anything to add? Last Yes, okay. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, his concern is very legitimate. Uh, most of you are responding to a call. It means that the funders drive the research agenda. I think what we African scientists, we haven't done well is after Abuja declaration, uh, where countries are supposed to contribute a certain percentage of their GDP, it has not materialized in most of these countries. And I think probably African scientists needs to come together from an advocacy country um, group that could lobby our countries and also, of course, through Africa CDC, how do we get this Abuja declaration happening? Thank you. So a round of applause for our presenters. Um, you know their faces. We are here for another three, four days, so please feel free to um, approach them if you'd like to ask more questions or provide your reactions. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm Pauline Beatty. I'm the operations manager at EDCTP. I'm based in The Hague. Uh, we're on to session two of this morning's proceedings. We're running a bit behind schedule, but I hope you'll stay with us and give your attention to the next set of speakers and discussions coming up. So we've heard a lot this morning about challenges and some potential solutions, and I know all of you in the room are the potential solutions to these challenges. I want to introduce uh, the next speaker, who's Adrian Kruger. And I think in a brief introduction, two words, technological wizard, probably sums it up. Uh, Adrian is the CEO and co-founder of Nouveautech. And uh, this company, I think, set up about 14 years ago in South Africa, is really at the forefront of uh, digi digital innovation and transformation. And he's going to talk about the alumni platform, but also uh, about some other work that his company and he are doing to really drive forward innovative solutions in areas like clinical research and capacity strengthening. So over to you, Adrian. Good morning, everyone. Um, very, very nice to um, be here, and um, I feel um, totally undereducated going after all the previous speakers. Um, but it's great to be here. So well, let me see where my presentation is. I'll quickly go through this one. Oh, ah, look at that. Okay, let's see. Let me see. Okay, there we go. 
So, um, yeah, we, we're based out of South Africa. Um, we're a technology company. Um, we do a whole bunch of different things in the, in the technology space. Um, and now, really, we have a, a, a core sort of focus, and um, we're very passionate about digitizing clinical research. Um, we wanted to, when we started this, this venture, we wanted to build it out of South Africa and out of Africa for Africa. So we wanted to give a world-class solution and a set of platforms, but uh, making it uh, at an uh, available at an affordable price. And about six years ago, as we, um, we got introduced into the world of public health. And um, we've been very lucky to be part of a couple of different initiatives today where we help different um, national institutions, different groups um, to put um, platforms together that um, ultimately helps um, advance clinical research. So the platform I'm going to talk to you about today is the, the, the new alumni platform. Obviously, uh, most of you in the audience today are the alumni members. Um, and you've, you've worked on the EDSP alumni platform. You have your profiles on there. Um, and then we have gone through a bit of a total redesign of the platform itself, which we will be launching within the next coming days uh, or maybe weeks. Um, but today I'm going to give you a sneak preview of what the platform looks like and also some future plans that we have um, for you to showcase the wonderful research that you guys are doing. I know you've re read some of those points, but I know we pressed for time, so I'm going to sort of jump into it. So that's the view of the existing platform, as you would know it, um, if you go to the edspialumninetwork.org. And there on the right-hand side, it's just a, a bit of a look and feel of what the new modern platform looks like. Um, all of you will have access to that platform, and we have a, a three exhibition areas um, just outside the door here. Um, and you are more than welcome to go to any of my colleagues. They will also will all be wearing similar kind of um, um, outfits every day. So we all have our green jackets on today. Um, we're also South African. Um, but um, and you're welcome to um, um, to go there and update your profile. And if you have any questions or you're struggling with anything, they will take you through the platform and they'll help you keep your um, or get your profile as up to date as you can. Um, and also, um, like some of the map features, there was the old version of it, and you'll see the, the new version of it is a lot more intuitive. Um, we worked with a team of um, expert designers that, that went through um, a lot of um, effort to, to design it using modern uh, standardization and, and modern ways um, when it comes to behavioral psychology of how people use um, online platforms. So just I'm going to like let the platform run or the, the demonstration run. So this is an actual view of the platform of, of what it looks like and what it would look like. Um, obviously heavily connected to the four networks of excellence and all the fellows. At the moment we are focused on mainly the EDSTP 1 and 2 fellows, but I know with EDSTP 3 coming on board um, this platform will grow significantly and the idea is really here to um, to help um, sort of initiate and, and uh, be the catalyst for further discussion and uh, collaboration between fellows. Um, there's a whole bunch of different sections here really focusing on different disease areas. Um, we made, like I said, the map a lot more intuitive and it also allows for the actual searching functionality on the map. Um, we've enhanced a great deal that it makes it easier for you obviously to find a fellow based on a specific region or also based on a specific um, therapeutic area. Um, the platforms there on the right hand side, obviously it's still, um, everything is role based permission. So this is a public facing view. Um, there you can see some of the filters, but this is a public facing view. So this is available to the public. Uh, but like all of you that are fellows that you know, once you log in, there's a whole section there, um, really um, just uh, for you as a fellow. Um, here's the new view of what the profile view looks like. So you'll see it's a lot more rounded, a lot more refined in the way that it, that it is presented. Obviously, um, I think um, the, the magnitude of work and research that you as all uh, researchers have done that are obviously online on the call today and also here in the room today, um, I think you definitely deserve a, a, a beautiful platform like this. Um, the, the online, uh, so the networks of excellence, obviously we have the, the four different groups there. These are, um, are maintained um, through the ESTP team as the, the, the members change and as um, 
um, different things happen there, um, and it's also linked back to the profiles. Um, any of the funding opportunities is 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 going to be there, and if anyone from the from the public wants to engage with the EDCP office, um, they can go there. So here's when you log in. I think one of the big things that we that we um, implemented is something. Um, uh, around real-time notifications, or we call it the, the activity timeline. So it's very similar. We're all quite familiar with like LinkedIn. We use LinkedIn often. So you will now see, if you log onto the platform, you will see if anyone else uh, started maybe a new job or um, has published a paper or anything like that, you'll be able to congratulate them. Um, there's a view of how easy it is now to update your profile. I know uh, historically there was a, 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 a cumbersome. Um, so if you have any questions, once again, and if you want to update your profile and, and there are some questions about it, you're more than welcome um, to come to our stand. There's a dedicated stand to the alumni platform this whole week, and we will gladly assist you. So there's just a view from the, the interactive um, sort of notifications that, that do pull through um, into, um, this is sort of the members only area, and then from there you can click on any of those and it will either take you to the discussion forum or take you to uh, another fellow's profile, or if you want to congratulate them um, on, uh, on specific, something specific that they've achieved, um, they will then receive in return a message um, regarding you saying congrats. There's an example of that. So in the flip side, um, that specific fellow will receive a message on their side. Um, so this is a very, very high level overview. I think the, the best is um, really to see it um, firsthand. I'm just gonna quickly skip to the next one. So some of you might have seen and have heard of the platform called the Clinical Trials Community um, Platform, or ctc.africa, um, and it's also quite closely linked to CTCAN, the Clinical Trials Community Africa Network, which is a new initiative under the EDSTP. And our goal, um, I'm gonna let this platform play a little bit as well, but our goal with you as the alumni members um, is really to profile all of you on this platform as well. So we will have a direct link behind the scenes to profile all the great work you are doing. So the CTC platform that you see here, this is really a platform and that is, it was designed and we, we came up with the idea about five years ago and we wanted to profile the wonderful research capability that we have on the African continent. So in here we have a direct link into all the clinical trial registries like clinicaltrials.gov, PACTR, ICTRP and, and some of the others as well. So, and out of that registry, we've run it through a machine learning model that we um, developed ourselves, and it cleans the data so that we know exactly where all the research centers are. So we have roughly 3,500 research centers that have been profiled with GPS coordinates. And on there, we also know all the studies that those specific sites have conducted. So the idea with our linkage with the Fellows platform is we want to profile and link all of you to your research institutes so that you can also be discovered by a funder, by a biotech or a, um, a, um, a philanthropic group or a sponsor that might be um, in the um, process of doing site feasibilities or selecting research centers to help them with research. So this is the inside of the platform. Like here, you see my personal profile, but the idea is we will pull across all your data from the fellows um, platform, which will be the main source of the data. We'll basically just pull it through so that you can see it, everything here. And if you're in EDSTP alumni fellow, um, if you want to update your data, um, the, um, you will have to do that on the alumni platform. But yeah, basically the main idea is here to create the whole ecosystem um, and connect all these different platforms that we're working on and connect them together. You will see now I'm out of time. I'm gonna, there's like two more minutes, then I'll stop. Um, but you will see that um, another, some of the other initiatives that we are working on is to digitize regulatory agencies and also ethics committees. So if you have to do an ethics committee application or if you have to do a, a regulatory application out of the same platform, we will s seamlessly link you into those platforms. So we've already um, um, established that platform with the Nigerian regulator. We're launching the South African regulators platform in a couple of weeks. And we're also working very closely with Averif with their joint Point reviews and where they're also going to use the same platform so the our goal is really to build a complete ecosystem to not only showcase um, the wonderful work that all of you are doing um, but also for um, um, to, to sort of digitize the whole 
research um, process and uh, make it more appealing for, for people in the global north to send some funding our way. As you heard earlier, we only receive about 2.5% of the world's funding. So this is, um, once again, just a view of the platform. Um, but it, for those of you who don't know this platform, you're also welcome to, there we have a stand specifically for this platform as well. And we have like a whole interactive map of Africa with GPS coordinates and all of you, and we would love to profile you and the wonderful work you're doing in partnership, obviously with the alumni platform um, on this platform. So um, that's really in a nutshell. I know there might be a Q&A session at the end. So I'm gonna um, stop it there and then I'll buy us some time. Okay, cool. Thank you so much, uh, Adrian, and thanks for squeezing all that information into the, the time that we left you. And just to, if there's time at the end, there'll be time for questions. But I just to encourage everyone to look in at the booths and to really try out these amazing innovations. Okay, ne next I want to move on to funding and uh, to start with a presentation by Michelle on work that EDCTP has been doing to bring together the various funders of uh, fellowships in Africa. And this will be followed by some of the representatives of those funding agencies for a discussion and to take some questions and suggestions from you all. Michelle, over to you. Thank you, Pauline. Um, so my presentation today um, is going to provide a brief introduction into um, a group that we recently started at uh, EDCTP Africa office. And the group is the African Clinical Research Fellows Funders Group. Now, um, I'll just skip the outline. I just want us to have a, you know, just to recap the significance of investing in clinical research fellowships in Africa. And um, we all know that um, fellowships in Africa play a vital role in building research capacity, advancing medical no knowledge, addressing local health challenges, improving healthcare quality, and fostering collaboration. Um, this type of fellowships have the potential to positively impact healthcare systems, policy development, public health outcomes um, in the region and beyond. Now, just a bit of background. So according to WHO, Africa has approximately seven full-time employed health researchers per million population, while the Western countries have at least 300 um, per million population, and yet Africa is burdened by preventable diseases. So it's essential that we accelerate the development of science researchers and leaders for clinical interventions, interventions um, with the goal to develop efficient, safe, suitable, and affordable, affordable, affordable medical interventions to combat diseases in Africa. Now, EDCTP and like-minded organizations have already invested in this area for decades, but then there's been limited alignment and synergy between EDCTP and other funders in similar programs. And um, we've um, had the potential of um, risking duplication of effort, um, losing, you know, we lose track of funding gaps in the clinical development pipeline for potentially effective interventions. So in pursuit of alignment um, of all the funding partners, um, the DCP Africa office established the African Clinical Research Fellowship Funders Group in February 2023. Now the objectives of this group is to share information and knowledge related to clinical research funding opportunities, to try and facilitate the exchange of best practices and knowledge amongst the funders to optimize the impact of these funding initiatives. We're also aiming to promote coordinated collaboration amongst the funders to reduce duplication and to create a conducive environment for clinical research in Africa in order to increase the efficiency of funding allocation and utilization. But most importantly, we want to align our strategies and priorities for maximum impact and relevance in the African clinical research landscape. 
We also want to identify and support capacity building initiatives to strengthen clinical research in Africa, reduce the attrition of African trained fellows, which is still a big problem, and attract more investments in research and development. But also, most importantly, we want to monitor the progress and outcomes of clinical research fellowships supported by our members. Now, this is just a snapshot of the members who are part of this group. It's not an exhaustive uh, list. The group is still in its infancy, um, so uh, you know we're still adding more members as time goes. Now, um, the EDSP fellowship program, um, you know, we, we wanted to enhance the program and increase the number of fellowships, so we built partnerships with several group members, both in private and public um, non-profit sector. For, so an example is um, we worked with RF to um, implement the EDSP RF preparatory fellowships, which is basically um, a fellowship program that um, supports scientists and clinicians aspiring to receive um, grant support. We've also worked with WHO TDR to implement a very specialized um, fellowship that offers researchers and key members of research teams the opportunity to acquire hands-on technical and project skills uh, by, by placing them in pharmaceutical companies. We've also partnered with the Botner Foundation um, who supports some of our career development fellows. And we've also partnered with the GSK who are funding some fellows who are working um, on comorbidities between infectious diseases and NCDs. Now this is just a snapshot of our coverage um, across Africa. To date we have awarded, especially in the EDSP2 program, we have awarded 205 fellows um, and they cover 26 uh, sub-Saharan African countries, 79 are female and 126 are male. Um, together with the Africa CDC, we have collaborated in launching a call that um, addresses capacity development for disease outbreak and epidemic response in sub-Saharan Africa. Now to date, we've been able to onboard 151 epidemiologists and biostatisticians from 26 sub-Saharan African countries, and most of them are in this room. 42% of them are female and 58 of them are male. In addition to all these programs, we have a program that, um, as much as it's supported by the EDSTP, or rather it's administered by the EDSTP, this is a program that is um, supported by the UK. The UK is a partner of the EDSTP, and uh, they decided to provide support to the networks of excellence in order to close the gender and regional disparities, um, the, the gaps when it comes to gender and regional disparities in research. Um, so the UK, through the Department of Health and Social um, Health, the DHSC, contributed to the program under the EDIST PCR funding framework to support up to eight female PhD students per network. So the different networks um, are Cantum, that is supporting the WISE female PhD program. With East Africa, we have the Cafe C female PhD fellowship program. In West Africa, we have talent, and in Southern Africa, Chesa III is supporting the, the Tagendi Female Fellowship Program. And in total, to date, we have about 34 female PhDs who are supported across the networks of excellence. Now, what is the anticipated impact of the group? What we want to try and achieve is to contribute to significant enhancement of clinical research in Africa, which includes improved access to funding opportunities, the development of best practices, streamlined collaboration, focused research efforts, a stronger research workforce, and a more efficient allocation and ac accountability of resources amongst our members. Now, in order for us to inform the theory of change, for us to, ab to be able to achieve this impact, we need to be able to implement specific activities that will lead to long-term and short-term tangible outputs and outcomes. And having said that, we're going to move into the next session that will look at receiving feedback, or rather recommendations, suggestions, and feedback from our key stakeholders who are the fellows. So with that, I'll hand over to my colleagues in the panel session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Actually, we have made up a little bit of time I'd like to call now for the uh, panel members to come up. And we have uh, Manas Vahedi, 
Tom Nirenda, Caxton Muriro, and Akiko Keller, from TDR, from EDCTP, from Science for Africa, and from Novartis. Please join us up on the, the armchairs. So for the panelists, rather than me introduce you, I think when we, you give your intervention, please do give us a bit of an introduction about yourself and about your role in your organization and about uh, how, how you can contribute to uh, this discussion on uh, funding African fellowships. Caxton, I see you have the microphone first, so I'd like to hand over to you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, my name is Caxton Murira. I represent the Science for Africa Foundation uh, from Nairobi. We are an African organization that seeks to support and uh, promote science, technology, and innovation in the continent. My role at Science for Africa is I lead a program called Clinical Research and Trials Community. We seek to increase investments in the continent on clinical trials, and we work within the different uh, realms of the ecosystem. Uh, some of them Adrian has mentioned, such as the Clinical Trials Community Initiative and the CityCAD Initiative that seeks to improve uh, aspects of clinical research in the continent. Uh, in terms of how we see supporting this uh, initiative, we are working very closely with a different myriad of uh, stakeholders in the continent, one of which is uh, the uh, industry. Uh, we have an initiative called the cross Pharma Capacity Development Initiative, and we see a very strong uh, element of industry contributing to building this capacity. We are looking at harmonizing how they collaboratively come together, and I'm happy that Juta mentioned uh, some of the aspects that they are doing, coming with a joint uh, framework of action to implement some of those initiatives, which I'll talk about uh, later. Thank you. Uh, everybody, my name is Manaz Vahedi. I'm working in WHO TDR, and I am managing the um, TDR Clinical Research Leadership Program is a new program which is building upon the earlier program that we also um, have been working with colleagues in EDCTP on the Clinical Research and Development Fellowship Program. It's a program which is funded by Gates Foundation and the aim uh, for this new phase from this year until 2028 is to support at least 60 um, uh, clinical research leaders globally, including Sub-Saharan Africa. Many of our grantees coming from Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, also I'm managing another program, which is TDR Postgraduate Training Program, where we have several hubs, universities, including in Africa, and uh, f supporting people on postgraduate training, master's uh, program, uh, on uh, mainly on health system implementation research program. So it's very nice to be here, and uh, uh, I'll pass it to my colleague. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Akiko Keller. I work at Novartis and I lead our scientific capability building programs in our global health organization. So there I have the great privilege to actually run our different fellowship program, including the EDCTP um, fellowship programs where we have in the past uh, hosted scientists through the EDCTP career development, well, the clinical and R&D fellowship program, but also through the career development fellowship program. And I think for us, it's very clear that we gain a lot out of these types of collaboration by welcoming in scientists into our organizations, scientists that then can really teach our own researchers about the challenges, but also the opportunities about conducting um, yeah, research uh, across all low and middle income countries. And then at the same time, of course, our fellows gain 
a lot of direct training, mentorship as well, um, by staying, um, spending some time at our research facilities upon the return. And my question, or what I'm really curious is in better understanding, is what can be our role once these fellowship programs, once these grants come to an end? So really what happens there afterwards are the skills and the training that we offer to you really helpful in a longer term? And how can we really ensure that the trainings are applicable, the learnings are transferable to your home environments? And really ultimately, what can be our role from an industry perspective to really continue supporting um, you in your careers as you progress? Thank you. Hi, my name is Tom, as uh, I, I, you already <laughs> heard me speak earlier. And uh, Michelle has done quite a lot to describe the EDCDP approach. What I would say is that as a funder, we will also be very interested to hear from you on how we can make trainings much better and aligned. And I'll just give two specific examples from the previous work we have done, which Michelle has presented. Sometimes we design these programs with people who have been, uh, as our, our advisors, they did their training long time ago and times have changed. And, uh, but the people who are trained are younger. And uh, sometimes uh, people want to go to training with their children or um, their husbands or their wives. And it has been, terribly sad to see somebody pulling out of an application just because they have become pregnant during the course of waiting for the result of their application and that they can't go to good training or something has happened that could be have been manageable. So uh, there are some funder restriction that um, it's very difficult for, m for me to motivate in the boardroom that I would like to hear from users and uh, the people the beneficiaries and the trainees themselves and i think funders as funders we have very limited or poor structures to hear from potential trainees of how they would think it, it, their programs should be supported to get maximum impact so let me stop there pauline thanks okay at this point i think we're really turning it over to uh the you in the audience to ask this panel here, just to say we've heard from Tom, just about the, I guess, other issues. We've heard from Akiko, I think her question was, what happens after these training? How do we make them more sustainable? Caxton, I think, do you want to come in with a yes. question? Yeah, thank you so much. So my question is linked uh, actually to mostly what uh, Tom mentioned when he started uh, on equitable partnerships. So we think of ourselves as implementers at the high level where we collaboratively work with, uh, you know, uh, researchers to implement their work comfortably and also equitably um, by mutual respect. And that means listening to the needs of what they want to implement on the ground. So my question was mostly around how can uh, this uh, clinical research fellows funder group, funders group, you know, at the core of what they want to implement, listen uh, to what it is that uh, is important to, to the fellows. And I think that came out from one of the questions in terms of, you know, some of the funding being focused or may, may have an agenda in that sense. So how do we, uh, you know, listen actively and have the voice of the researcher uh, in terms of how some of these initiatives are, you know, are built and how that can be facilitated? And then secondly, how can we uh, leverage the gains of the fellows' work to uh, you know, inform future initiatives? Because we want to ensure that as you're implementing your work, then these outcomes or impacts are used to influence how new initiatives are built. Not really in reinventing the wheel, but building upon what exists so that we can have a more sustainable um, uh, implementation of initiatives. Thank you. Th thanks, Captain. Let's hear from Manas. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I have a very brief question um, to you. 
as fellows and perhaps some of the alumni, that how could you, the alumni or fellow, play a role, a major role, in the mentorship program uh, for the more junior men uh, mentees? Or how can you access uh, mentors uh, for your work? We heard uh, from uh, uh, previous speakers that there is a functional platform currently uh, that EDCTP has uh, developed. And uh, we just want to hear from you how to do this. Because it's easily said, even in TDR, we talk about good practices for mentorship. But in reality, uh, what is the incentives for you to be able to be a mentor? Thank you. Okay, so now we're on to what's called Ask the Audience, if people have watched that Millionaire programme. And Michelle has a lot of questions coming through online, and I'm trying to urge you in the audience to become part of the, I guess, the speakers. First of all, I see we have Val Snoo in here. Val, over to you for a question. Okay, I'll get nearer. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, I'm Val Snewin from, um, from the UK. I'm from the uh, NIHR, which is basically the research funding arm of the UK Ministry of Health. And as um, um, the speaker showed, we've been funding EDCTP uh, for quite a few years now, and including the um, female PhD student scheme. So uh, we're not currently included in the funders group, but we very much like to be invited. And I think some of us as, as research funders, we try and be good partners and we try and fund through other organizations rather than always kind of having our own label on things. And maybe that means we, we sometimes also fly a bit under the radar. Um, so I, what I feel is that we do have our own schemes and that we have a newsletter you can sign up to. Um, you'll hear about schemes, they're all open to people from low and middle income countries. It's, it's uh, entirely a global health research program. Um, so I was going to ask actually also the audience, maybe to get that interactive um, aspect that Pauline's asking for, is maybe just put your hands up if you thought that the interactive platform that we've seen here does look like something that you would engage with. I mean, the world is littered with these platforms now. We're all on LinkedIn or Facebook and everything else. So if you would feel that that did look good and interesting, please put your hands up, maybe. No pressure. And, and because I feel that sounds great, that looks brilliant. And I, what I would say is some of the things, these ex excellent questions that the panel have asked, my own kind of naive view is that some of those things could be done through that platform. So we funders, we would really love to know what you all think, genuinely, and how you can also help us make our funding better, because we need to get the next generation of people coming through um, as peer reviewers and as on our funding committees, et cetera, and as mentors and helping in all those other ways. And maybe that online platform, which I thought looked really good, maybe that is a way that we can facilitate both the funders side and the fellows side engaging a bit more. And for me, EDCTP is absolutely the right funder to be um, facilitating both some of us other funders as partners and also you as the, as the people actually doing doing all the work, and uh, as the next cohort of, of people coming through to leadership roles. So the, I guess those are my two points. First, don't forget us, NHR, um, in the UK. And second, yeah, maybe think, let's think about how the platform itself could answer some of the questions that are being asked. Thank you. Thank you, Val. Sean, go ahead. Yes, uh, Pauline. Uh, I would like just to, to answer uh, Tom's uh, question and maybe one, one, one more uh, about uh, what can be done. Uh, what advice we can have to EDCTP for uh, improving the fellowship program? So I speak. I spoke earlier about mentoring, how critical that it is, and uh, one of the issue we uh, experienced in Welcome Trust Accord program and MEPI was the paucity, the paucity of mentor, qualified mentor, and one idea to solve the problem was to, to create what we call a triangular mentoring program where we have a local mentor uh, and the overseas mentor. 
it did work well in some country, but not in all country. One issue was that some of the high income country mentors did not feel any incentive uh, to spend their time mentoring. On the other side, a uh, fellow from the LMIC, they, they found the high income mentor a stranger. They don't have any tie, uh, some of them. Uh, but uh, so my question is, uh, could we engage in some kind of uh, uh, planning together, some kind of uh, mentoring the mentor program, uh, where well-qualified mentor can train other mentor, how that can be supported? I know UCSF have uh, some kind of uh, that type of program. Uh, I think this is something we should uh, think about uh, to try to address the issue of uh, you know, lack of uh, qualified mentor on the continent. John, thanks very much for that. Tom, go ahead. Yeah, th thanks very much, John. Uh, and those are the suggestions we really, we really need. And um, I'm glad Var is here as well, and uh, as our main funder, UK. But I would say, if for us to really put something like that in place, what is required is just resources. Because that North-South uh, cooperation, as you say, maybe some, some of it, it's just to do with um, lack of proper, uh, you know, uh, facilitating kind of uh, uh, resources. I would say, so it's not just funding, but it could be, you know, you know, easy platforms to do that, for example, et cetera, et cetera, so that nobody feels burdened and um, and and what I think is also important is I don't know how you do it, but may if if somebody is brought into the triangle as a by the way, they're probably more likely to feel as an outsider than when you start from the beginning, when you're training, you know, to involve them so that the planning is not just local, but the planning is uh, local with uh, an international eye. And, and, and I think that needs time to a little bit develop that. And uh, you can have a pool of mentors in Europe or America and then in <coughs> Africa, but that needs to come into kind of a program. So I insist with you know, the issue of programs because the moment is projects, they become time bound and then you, you can't go beyond a certain a point and it's pointless. And that's why I was looking at the Africa CDC, that it, it needs to be programs. And when it becomes programs, then everybody builds on that f for the future. So that would be my contribution. Uh, thanks, Tom. I think I would say then the recommendation that's coming is that the funders, EDCTP here for Tom, and I'll bring in TDR in a minute, um, is to create that program. So I'll summarize as that. Over to uh, TDR, go ahead. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Tom. Uh, it's critical to have a pool of mentors, and we have many mentees usually, but the challenge is to have mentors within the continent who can be committed. One point that I just want to mention, also the relation between mentors and mentees are quite uh, interesting because they both could be quite good, but the, you know they, there is a bit of chemistry has to uh, has to be established because if they from the beginning they don't speak the same language, it fails. That's why that the triangular um, process may not be successful, and I think it's an area that we funders we all need to think about. In TDR, we started thinking about good mentorship programs but we're still thinking how to do that. We have uh, more than 400 graduate, you know, postgrads since 2015, and we have 200 fellows in, uh, in the clinical fellows, and we have more than 20,000 uh, scientists. But to find right mentors, it's always a challenge. And I'm very interested to know how jointly we can uh, work on that. Thank you. Thanks for that. Maybe hands up in the audience. Who, who wants to be a mentor and who's looking for a mentor? Who wants to be one? <coughs> Plenty of takers. And who's looking for a mentor? 
Yeah, okay. So I think we've made a match there. Uh, I'd like to take the gentleman over here because he's been standing for a while. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. My name is uh, Mashinda. I come from Kinshasa. I'm the dean of Kinshasa School of Public Health, where we have a program of fellowships. I want to address my experience, to give the experience of Kinshasa School of Public Health and address to terms. I see there that there are so many women, so if we compare with men, when you see the fellowships. And this is the same thing in Kinshasa in Congo, to have a big impact to gender, to encourage the danger, the gender. And we conduct a study to know why don't uh, gender, the gender, the wives don't come to Kinshasa School Hub because have to do the masters. And we deserve and discover many reasons pregnant and they have these children under five years and the influence of their husband. This is the three main reasons. And so we decided to resolve this problem to bring more women. And we have a room in the surround of the school, of the university, where when a woman, when she's pregnant, can sit there, still she will give the baby. And after that, when the, after the, 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 the delivery, she have the possibility to come with a uh, 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 a mother and or a sister. We come there and sit there with the baby. When the, the wife is in the class, and she can do the child to, to go to see the baby. And the two and the three, the babies, the, the wife who was delivered and the, the mother is in charge of Kinshasa School of Public Health. And uh, there is another challenge. The, the, the other challenge is the wife who, who has uh, children under five years. And we are thinking, we, have, we are thinking to have a house when we can put all the wife with five, children under five years because they come from very far. And something that nurses or mama who can train the school, the, the, the children when they, the mother is in the classroom. This can bring more wives to School of Public Health and to, to, to enhance the number of families. But this is quite found. We have not this find. When you give funds for fellowships, you don't, you, you don't maintain this budget, this land of budget, the land of budget. So here, my request is if we can think to give some funds to such as activities. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that. And uh, yeah, as you described, I think finding out what the solution is, often asking the right question to the right people. And um, that's an important point, I think, that can be put into the discussions. Over to our next uh, person waiting patiently. Thank you very much. My name is Pauline Biachika Chibuika. I'm a professor of internal medicine from Makere University. And um, chair of the Malaria Working Group for the EDCTP uh, Fellows. Uh, what I want to say is, um, first I want to thank EDCTP because you have trained a large pool of scientists across Africa, including myself, who have moved on to significant uh, positions, have progressed with career. The grants that we usually apply for, usually are for specific projects, scientific projects. And um, oftentimes they may include one or two PhD students um, or some early career scientist uh, training. Uh, but we know that the need in Africa is much more than we are addressing currently. And also we know that in Africa, our scientists are introduced to research at a quite a late stage. Um, while our colleagues in the developed world start exposure to research at a much earlier um, age in, in, in medical school. They have internships in laboratories, they go to research projects. Some of the funders have started to do that in Africa, but it's still at a very small scale. So my suggestion is uh, to you, EDCTP, in terms of training the next generation, is it possible for you to increase the number of training grants for those accomplished scientists to apply for and provide small grants for early career scientists, including students, small grants to expose them to research methods, to how to conduct research, 
so that we get them exposed at an early age and we train uh, um, the future generation of research scientists in Africa at an earlier age. This comment I'm making is in line with a comment on mentorship, but combining both training and mentorship. We recently conducted a survey on mentorship and the mentors commented saying, yes, they are willing to comment, I mean to mentor, but they lack the facilities to mentor. And in addition to talking and telling, pointing mentees to directions where opportunities are, they would also be um, happy to find some resources to be able to mentor while also um, exposing the young generation to some kind of um, introduction to research or something like that. So I hope I put my point clear. <laughs> increase the number of training grants for the well-accomplished scientists to apply for so that they can train a pool of next generation scientists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Pauline. In the interest, I think, of, uh, we've got that suggestion also to say the networks were going to high schools to uh, try to encourage uh, young women or young girls to get into science as well. So we'll add that to the list. I want to uh, let Michelle read out some of the questions that have come in online. Thanks, Pauline. So I just want to be fully transparent here, um, just to let you know that this is, we were testing the waters. We wanted to see whether there'd be any interest in, you know, probably having a joint um, stakeholder meeting with the fellows and the funders, because I think this conversation needs to be to, to carry on and we need more than half an hour. And from the reactions and everything, I think, I think there's a need. So panel members, we have work to do. <laughs> All right, so I'll just uh, give some comments, um, questions from the, from the Zoom attendees. So Leah Ferguson um, has a comment or rather a question. So she says one of the challenges she found being in, being in a research career post is most of them are contract positions such that you need to renew your contract annually or every three years, fund dependent, which of course leaves income uncertainty, especially when they're dependents like, dependents like children and you know you, school fees are needed. Please advise how to address this challenge. I'm not sure who will take this question because I'd like to move on to the next. I think I can take that yeah. question based on uh, some previous discussion about patient funding. And I think uh, it speaks more to um, Michelle, the objectives of this group, because um, as you mentioned, there, was, there has been duplication of efforts mm. previously by funders uh, providing funding for the same thing. And by providing joint initiative where we can plan and see ahead where there are du um, duplicated or joint initiatives that can be funded for longer periods, in the case of funding beyond the contract period, if it's three years or two years and a different funder can offer funding beyond um, the current years, then that provides value. I think EDCTP has been a patient funder for quite some years, but there's need for uh, other funders to come in. Uh, there has been also focus, as I mentioned before, on the industry also participating uh, very closely, and there is interest by industry to participate. So also them having a front seat in terms of participating uh, through funding uh, or patient funding then provides a bit of more sustainability at that level. Thank, Thank you. you. So I'll take another question from um, the virtual group. Um, Jimmy Patrick Alunio asks, how can we be supported to share our research findings as fellows without having to compete for the limited scholarships available? might okay. be an unanswerable uh, <laughs> question, uh, actually. Yeah. All right, so I'll, as, you, as you think about how to respond, I'll move on to the next um, question. And Chanalev Negatue, I hope I've done your name justice. Um, from low-income countries, career development take time, especially for females. After several fights to be able to apply for grant applications, the time for early career fellowships have passed. Um, and they may not reach, they may not be at the level for a senior fellowship. 
um, most of the fundings do not, uh, funding does not consider this, this group. Um, so, so what are your reactions to this? Was the comment or question clear? Maybe I'm answering okay. this yeah. one. Uh, I, I, uh, oh, sorry, uh, go ahead. Thank you so much. I think this is where if we have a proper mentorship program, people can help each other to um, submit applications for fellowships. And uh, we get large number of applications and sometimes it becomes very difficult. Um, and sometimes people don't address the question rightly. So if the work that the EDCTP is doing with the platform maybe is opportunity to open it also to non-EDCTP grantees and we also have for TDR maybe we need to discuss how best we can as funders we can have repository of different trainings for to apply for different grants and people get trainings to apply this could be one option but uh, I think this is a major challenge. And in, in line with this, I, I would like to raise another issue, that how do we reach out to those less representative countries through our program? Because quite often it becomes like a cycle. The stronger institutions, they have the capacity, so the students from those institutions apply, and the application is very good and strong, and they do get the grant. But you know, we also need to think through our um, funders group how best we target the less representative institution and countries and strengthen their capacity. So it's something that we're thinking of. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Manasi. I think part of the question was also about, I guess, women who've taken time off for to have families. And I would say I think that most funders now and when they count research experience, they also take account of any gaps that people have had, and that includes women and men in terms of caring responsibilities. And thinking back to the previous question about the, the fellow who was asking about how to communicate research findings when you know the money is limited, I think we're seeing more and more open access repositories for publications where it takes away this need to pay uh, a journal a lot of money. And just to say that it, at the forum, we actually have a, a session with journal editors. So perhaps someone could also take that question up at that session. I'd like to come over to the two people here who've been waiting patiently. Over to you. Yeah, th thank you so much, Pauline. Uh, one of the things, um, uh, just before I say that, I'm Patrick O'Willy, uh, uh, a senior research scientist and um, a program manager at the African Population and Health Research Center uh, in Nairobi. Uh, Pauline and Tom, when you came to Nairobi, you realized that uh, the capacity development of applied epidemiologists that I lead had 706 applicants. Uh, that is 706 applicants from 21 countries. That tells you how, you know, people are desiring, they have the urge of being trained uh, to be astute researchers, not only astute researchers, but also to be people who are well equipped uh, for disease surveillance in Africa. And uh, in this fellowship program, we were also conducting a training for their supervisors, the graduate student supervisors, uh, answering the question you asked, what can be done? You know, when I was teaching in the university, I was given students to supervise, to mentor, and no one trained me to mentor students. So I would use the style of mentorship my former PhD supervisor was using. And in this program, we were training the supervisors also to be good mentors. And we assure all our fellows are graduating in time. 
And this aspect of mentorship, training the mentors, you know, people may think that uh, mentorship is inborn, but it can be a skill that can be developed. And so this is one very important aspect that needs to be considered in terms of funding. How can mentors be trained to be good mentors who are able to support these young scientists to grow up much better? And secondly, and last in 30 seconds, the aspect of public engagement. You know, we have these researchers, fellows, they, they have done research, but are they being kept in the shelves or probably after publication that is the end of it? How can the aspect of public engagement be brought in? Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. So I think I heard for our panel about training the mentors, training the supervisors. I'm going to put Akiko on the spot here for one difficult question of Patrick's. He mentioned he, they ran a competition for master's students for 15 places. They had 700, more than 700 applications. Novartis is doing its bit training, but how, how can this funder group, how can Novartis contribute to it to try and address this issue of demand versus supply. Thank you so much. And these numbers were very impressive and to be honest, very similar to what we see from our end. I think what is really crucial is that all of the partners here at the table, we commit in for the long-term engagement. So as a student, if I put myself in the shoes of a student applicant, I really want to see, okay, if my application was not strong enough for this year's program, then hopefully I can just reapply next year. So that would be um, my hope. Now, there was a question before on by the time you actually get ready, then the opportunity has already gone. I think this is also important that um, as kind of a group of different funders with different interests, we really make sure that we have a portfolio of opportunities of trainings tailored really all the different career stages. And one comment I wanted to just to make on the mentorship piece is actually, I also want to encourage all of you to kind of change the role that you had. You might have started kind of being a mentee, but as you progress in your careers, you can really change, become a mentor yourself and kind of continue giving back the experience that you self had. So this is really what we also try to do within our own fellowship programs. And so this is kind of amongst, like if I think about the South to South mentorship or you're the local um, mentorship opportunities that we have. And when it comes from us, like the industry mentors, to have that successful, um, I think the crucial point is really that we say all the engagements that we have with, with public or academic um, research partners, it has to have that shared research interest in the center. So if we actually can identify motivated scientific um, mentors amongst our side, then we are in the best scenario to actually set up and find the matching mentees from your end. Thank, Thank you very much, Akiko. I'm going to pass on to a question and then just uh, pinpoint one of the panel. Stella, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, uh, Dr. Polly. Thank you very much, EDCTP, for organizing this uh, platform. I'm Stella Mpagama, uh, one of the EDCTP2 Senior Research Fellows uh, working in Kilimanjaro, Tanzania and my area of focus is tuberculosis, largely TB, but I'm also doing other things. Yeah, just to reflect the questions which have been posed by the funders, um, uh, how do we ensure that we can sustain the developed capacity? Yeah, so I think for the fellows, uh, main task will be to mobilize more resources and continue building from where we have started that also would like to request the funders, uh, for example, MRC, if not mistaken, they've developed a nice framework for which you can gauge yourself as you are moving to the research leadership. They've described 
uh, domains which someone must acquire. So it is easy to go and put uh, the mirror and see where are you and which elements you need to strengthen. Uh, we are missing that uh, a framework for the lower levels, the, the mentorship and the, the training skills, etc. Uh, so it means there is one for senior to research lead in Africa, but we are missing from the the lower, we can say intermediate level. So if funders can help, of course, in collaboration with us, because that one which was developed by MRC, it engaged majority of African researchers. So if we can, we can work collaboratively, we can come up with a framework for developing uh, early career researchers. Number two, uh, most of the research, of course, in Africa is largely supported by the Westerns. But to put an element of ownership, particularly to the higher government leaders, I would request the, the, fund, the funders organization you have introduced that now you are collaborating. Uh, through that collaboration and the existing frameworks which are currently set, the African Union framework, you can, uh, through that we can perhaps present some of the big outputs to the African head of states so that they can start owning this. At the end, these things can be mainstreamed as part of our practices in our countries. Yeah, I think through the funders, of course, we can work together to ensure that these things are campaigned and are being factored in. Thanks. Thanks, Stella. I think uh, there are very uh, good points uh, that I hope w our panel are noting, but this idea of a framework or benchmark that people could measure against as they develop their careers, and also about, I think, this idea of strength and voice in terms of what the needs are and what needs to be addressed. I'd like to take the next question before coming back to the panel. Go ahead, please. I'm Veronique Penlap from the University of Yaoundé One, head of the unit of research in clinical uh, um, biology at the University Catholic of uh, Cameroon, part of CAMTAM network. I've been also um, head of the TB laboratory research at the same university. My intervention will concern especially the collaboration that should be strengthened within research uh, uh, who are part of the different EDSP network. I know we have Pandora, we have Alert Project, we still really uh, need more, more joint project to be presented that strengthen the collaboration between the different network. And this will really help to share experiences to really share knowledge on science and then um, um, offer the opportunity of those who are less trained to really strengthen their skills at the different um, um, uh, competencies that are required for clinical research. Also, this collaboration um, concern organizing joint conferences within the different network and then organizing also specific training that can call for the different scientists from these four networks to come and participate. So I also think we can think, I don't know how we can do that, create an EDSP center for excellence. I don't know where this can be based, where people can come from all over the, the countries, especially in Africa, to really acquire these good training skills, uh, good training skills that can really uh, give them the opportunity to participate to project, program, research program, and then access to funding. We also have um, this uh, limitation in um, English barrier for those people coming from French speaking countries. I don't know how EDSP is going really to work on that. We doesn't, ha we doesn't have problem for knowledge, even for 
uh, experiences or not. But we don't know how to speak, to write a good project in the English language that really can bring our project to be selected and then access to more grants. And uh, I don't know how we can do that. For the mentorship plan, uh, I can maybe suggest that we could think of this strategy where a mentor can be based in Ghana and the mentee in Cameroon so that people from different languages come together and this can maybe help to strengthen the English speaking uh, um, proficiency of one of the other. Those are my different, different uh, suggestions. Also, play it for more grants for women. I don't know how we can do that. More grants for women. I know we have Career Development Fellowship. We have WISE. Uh, we are benefited of WISE also, but there's not enough space for all the women that can really, uh, that are in need of, of support for EDSP, for their PhD and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Penlap. <coughs> Excuse me, I'd like to go to Caxton and then on to Tom, because I think you mentioned collaborations, training centres, language barriers. Caxton, over to you. Uh, thank you so much for that question, uh, Prof. I think what you've mentioned in terms of collaboration is quite important for us. Uh, I did mention uh, an initiative called CTCAN, which means Clinical Trials Community Africa Network. And the main agenda for this network is bringing together the different initiatives in the continent, uh, some of them being networks that exist, uh, CANTAM, ONETAM, ESCCR, and TESA, and coming up with a joint uh, implementation plan. So I think where that is, is important is because we, have, we, we understand that uh, different networks and the individuals within these networks have different focus areas of disease and strength, and having this joint network implementation plan that brings together these networks, including others such as Panther, Alerts, and others that uh, may have not been mapped yet, uh, will help us deliver some of the aspects that uh, we as Africans are looking at. Uh, for example, uh, pandemic preparedness, uh, which was a very important aspect during COVID. How can we activate the different expertise in the continent? So I think it's quite important to have that specific element uh, of um, networking and, and that specific initiative which is funded by EDCTP is one of the elements that we're looking at uh, implementing. Uh, so we'll be reaching out to the different networks if uh, the initiative has not yet reached out to, to you. Uh, regarding uh, the aspect of training and looking at bre breaking the barriers of language, uh, we also at Science for Africa Foundation implementing a research management uh, program that looks at aspects that are not research specific, for example, drafting a proposal that can go through a rigorous process of review, uh, which we think is quite important to give those kind of skill sets. And then also, through the different questions, there's the aspect of mentoring the mentor. Uh, initially, we had an engagement of uh, an initiative called MentorNet, which is a network of mentors, where these mentors come together and share the expertise that they want to you know, highlight uh, for the benefit of fellows who want to uh, address them. And then also train these mentors to understand how to deliver some of the aspects of andragogy and you know engaging at the level of you know mentor mentee kind of engagement, and also just you know appreciating the work that they do because uh, what's the incentive of a mentor is quite important, and aspects such as the CTC platform and uh, the network uh, EDCTP network uh, platform highlighting some of these aspects is some of the attribution that can help a mentor become more encouraged to mentor others. Of course, there is no prize for mentorship. There is no award for mentorship. So having an aspect of you know, a recognition uh, for the mentorship aspect is quite important. Thank Thanks you. very much for that, Caxton. I think before I come to Tom, because we're going to have to wrap up, I'm going to go to the rest of the panel members and just ask them in one or two sentences, having heard from our fellows here, what are you going to do? when you get back to your office to say, okay, we need to do this. What, what, what have you heard that's the most important thing and you feel you can take action on? Thank you. Um, I found this session quite enriching and useful. 
when I go back to our working group, uh, there are a couple of important issues. One is ensuring more women uh, benefiting from the programs, uh, issue of mentorship, and also giving opportunities to fellows at different uh, stages of the, the training program, which means that we need to align our work uh, across different programs and funders so we don't duplicate efforts, but uh, we uh, address all the constants. So uh, these are the main issues that I think uh, I'm going to address at my capacity. In Thanks very much, Manas. Akiko? Thank you. I have two points as well that I will take away. So one is for sure to really kind of reflect on what are the skills or um, criteria that you actually have to bring in order to continue to be successful in your careers beyond your grant expires or your fellowship comes to an end. So really to understand kind of this maybe terminology of employability. So how can you continue to be, stay an active researcher in the academic or public environment? And then secondly, um, is of course when we talk about, think about again like this application rate of the demand and offering is I would like to invite all of our other colleagues from industry to really join these types of conversations so that we can really ensure that we leverage our synergies and avoid duplications efforts going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tom, I'd like to hand over to you to give the last remarks and uh, take us into lunch after we close this session. Thanks very much, uh, Pauline, and thanks to my fellow panelists. I have also my take-home messages, and they align with what my colleagues have said. I think we started a good thing as a funders group, and we have collected quite uh, a lot of uh, input here that we will need to go back and digest. And I know there's more more funders that want to join the group. They will find these issues um, uh, anew, but also may enrich the discussion. The issues of partnerships, North-South, in terms of um, uh, mentorship to supplement the South-South, and uh, what came out there of resource allocation to such uh, 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 processes, uh, to me, comes came up to be really a very important issue. I wanted to pick out on the issue on DRC, from DRC where they have a, uh, they provide a, a crash, uh, a place, a maternity uh, facilities for female trainees until they deliver they are on the campus, etc., etc. that such type of experiences need to be collected as case studies. And uh, that's how we build uh, good practices anyway. And if we can have good studies like that and uh, well costed, uh, that uh, is not very frightening to funders, but well uh, um, sellable and uh, you know um, m rationalized, I think that that would be a, a good thing to do. So our colleague from DRC has left, but I think you can pass the message. We will, I will reach out to him with my team and uh, we can see how we can uh, document what you have shared from Congo. I, I find that very, uh, um, uh, I found that uh, very um, uh, impress impressive to, to learn from. I'm sure there are so many other cases that didn't come out. So if there's no any other comments from my colleagues, okay, I guess Tony has. <laughs> So, so just one comment uh, to the colleague who mentioned about uh, digitization. Uh, I really like that comment because, and I'm putting Adrian on, this, on the spot right now, because we've been discussing how can we have this platform being a one-stop shop for all information, even to early career researchers. How can we have jobs available through the platform? How can we have mentorship opportunities being available through the platform? And also for funders and the industry to publish within this platform. So it's a chicken and egg situation because the value of the platform comes with what's in it for me to publish my information there. So if I want to keep my information up to date, I must get value. Also on LinkedIn, it's the same thing. So I think this is a call to action to the funders and to also industry players. If we can have this information publicly, 
available through this platform. It gives the value to the users to keep the information up to date, which is the core of this platform. Thank you. Okay, final remarks, Tom, and then we have an opportunity for a photograph before we can get our lunch. Tom, thank My you to the panel. On behalf of uh, EDCTP, uh, I would like to really thank the organizers of this session, the participants, moderators, and speakers for uh, a very well-run uh, session. As you have seen, as Michael said, this is for us a, a very big flagship program and a focus of how science should be driven to have a group of people behind the global movement against uh, diseases. So we will keep pushing on. The energy comes from you. We have a big community building up. As Manaz said, TDR Global is thousands and thousands of fellows and EDCTP is coming up with uh, a few hundreds. And if we put the house together, we should be talking about uh, a battalion that should be always ready anywhere around the, can uh, around the world to, to respond. And what is required is what we are discussing here today on the house, how to do it, where are the resources, how can we do it together, et cetera, et cetera. So, Thank you very much for all the comments and suggestions. And yeah, so we'll see you in the next forum in Africa, which was announced, uh, or will be announced today, but it was announced in the EDCTP committees that it will be on one of the most beautiful East African country called uh, Rwanda in Kigali. But uh, in between, we will still be engaging and we need to do that. We need to continue, uh, especially through new tools like Adrian presented, the platform, et cetera, et cetera. So enjoy the rest of the forum, and we are always around. If there's anything we, you need us to discuss that an idea pops up after the conference, let's pull each other around the corners and give each other um, a boost towards this. Uh, uh, it's a revolution. It's a revolution, I think, we have to do it the way we, we want to respond. And that's the most important thing, that it's not prescribed, but it's from you. Thank you very much. So the photo is outside? Oh, yeah, on the, after the balcony. OK. Behind the, yeah. Thanks.